Um, before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that this webinar is being recorded and the recording is going to be posted on our website. So please refrain from saying your name or using any personal identifiers. If you have any concerns, please let us know. And we'd like to remind you to be sure that your computer camera remains disabled. Welcome to the Living Well webinar entitled Living with the Fear of Recurrence. My name is Meredith Mendelson, and I'm the manager of the Cancer Survivorship Program at the Swedish Cancer Institute. I have the pleasure of introducing our webinar speaker tonight. Dr. Shamim Najad is Swedish Cancer Institute's Medical Director for Psycho-Oncology Services. His clinical interests and expertise revolve around the provision of care for patients with complex medical and surgical illness involving neuropsychiatric and substance use disorders. Dr. Najad has been active in teaching internal medicine, surgery, and psychiatry trainees, and has received numerous awards for his teaching, as well as his care of patients. Through his work in clinical care, research, and education, Dr. Najad has sought to improve the care of patients at the interface of medicine and psychiatry. I now will turn it over to Dr. Najad. All right, thank you, Meredith. Thanks for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I think we're back on track here. Um, I, before we get started, I don't have any disclosures to declare. Um, so the topic today, as Me Meredith mentioned, is fear of cancer recurrence. Um, and the roadmap is basically we'll talk about um, the definition of fear of cancer recurrence, or FCR, as we'll kind of commonly refer to it today. We'll talk a little bit about the epidemiology that's behind uh, this, the, some of the current research that has been done, and then uh, hopefully some take-home strategies that people can utilize um, uh, to assist themselves and, and their loved ones. So, you know, at the time of cancer diagnosis, um, th there's a few things that people experience that's pretty, pretty commonplace. And for the most part, most diagnoses of cancer are, are unexpected. And with that, there's a lot of significant emotional distress and fear that arises. And when we do distress screenings at the time of diagnosis or, or at the beginning of treatment, these, these numbers can be pretty elevated and, and people are having a significantly difficult time. There's also stress regarding decision making based on the data or the limited data that they may have available and whether or not they're making the correct decisions for themselves. The challenges to the sense of self, and then um, elements to grief and loss. At the completion of treatment, there's usually this anticipation that illness is over and it's, quote, you know, time to get back to life as usual. And, you know, for those who have gone in the cancer journey, this is not necessarily the case, and many will have to face a new normal, so to speak. Um, and there's also cessation of contact with the cancer treatment team. And, you know, there's been some significant relationships and attachment that has developed over this course of time. And, you know, one aspect that we try to assist with that is the development of the survivorship program and so that there's some continued links uh, between those who have had cancer treatment and their providers. And then, you know, as people kind of um, go back and try to reintegrate, there can be some difficulty, especially with friends, family, work, and multiple domains. So there's a lot of things that happen um, following cancer treatment, and unfortunately, it's not necessarily just over and life moves on. So what is fear of cancer recurrence? So there's a great quote here. It's like a whale that moves into your living room. Over time, the whale gets smaller, but never quite goes away completely. A tenant who can't, you can't get rid of, maybe it gets down to the size of a magazine rack. Once in a while, you bump into it, and sometimes it swells up into your face again, like when you're having a mammogram and they call you back for extra views. So um, there's a few things before we get into FCR per se. There's also a the concept of the fear of disease progression. And this has been talked about for, gosh, many years. Um, and basically, it's any fear related to the illness itself or that it will progress with all its biopsychosocial consequences or that it will recur. And we see this in many other chronic illnesses. And some of the ones that have actually the, the most elevated um, uh, risk and severity of symptoms include rheumatic disease, Parkinson's, inflammatory bowel disease, but you can obviously infer that cancer is in there as well. 
Um, but the thing that, to remember, it's an adequate response to the real threats that are associated with diagnoses, treatment, and a course of an illness. And similarly, you know, the fear of cancer recurrence has been developed in parallel or an offshoot of this as it relates to cancer itself. And so one of the more agreed upon definition for the fear of cancer recurrence is the fear or worry that cancer will return or progress in the same organ or another part of the body and it's, it's multi-dimensional. So, you know, is, is it fear? Is it anxiety? Is it some type of worry? For the most part, it's a type of health-related anxiety. And in the sense that this is not an abnormal um, development. And so as such, it is not necessarily pathological or makes its way into, for example, the DSM or the Diagnostic Statistical Manual as some type of disorder or psychiatric disorder. So ranges from normal to very severe symptoms of anxiety. And pretty much it can develop at any point following diagnoses. And, um, when we look at the epidemiological studies, and to be honest with you, there's actually some studies that show that it's as high as 99% of people. So, you know, I think again, it goes back to the point that this is this is an appropriate response to a, to a real threat of illness. But in general, when you look at all the data, it's roughly between 22 to 74% of people who do have a history of cancer. And when we actually do scales, you can see moderate to high levels in up to almost 50% of survivors of cancer. And when you look at specific vulnerable groups, that number goes as high as 70%. And when we look at real severe symptomatology, it's about 7% of folks. But it, it, you know, taken together, you're looking at well over 50% of people in survivorship that have difficulty. And clearly, it's identified as one of the, if not the greatest, unmet needs of cancer survivors. And so this is an area that we need a lot more um, uh, investment in terms of research and, and clinical um, uh, responses to, uh, certainly. The, interestingly, when people have done also some research looking at um, what health professionals think, and th there's one study that looked at psychosocial professionals, or those who are actually involved in the, in the psycho-oncology realm, they found that n greater than 90% found that managing FCR was at least somewhat challenging, and about over 99% were interested in further training. So not only is it an unmet need just for patients, but it, there's also an unmet need in terms of education and those who are involved in the psychosocial arena and the care of patients. And similarly, when we look at studies specifically for oncologists, um, those numbers actually end up being pretty high as well. So about 71% were interested in further training, and 46% found that dealing with FCR was rather challenging, as you, we might expect. So again, lots of unmet needs in multiple domains in this area. So what is the time course? Well, what we know is in the first year following a cancer diagnosis, and we've talked about this already, overall distress is pretty high, and we find in that first year it actually starts to decrease slightly. Now, while overall distress goes down, FCR pretty much remains constant, um, but we do know that it does seem to decrease once a treatment phase is successfully completed. So, for example, following you know, a successful surgical intervention, following chemotherapy or radiation, we do see that the level of FCR goes down but it kind of tends to plateau and remain there. And what we actually see is one in three folks will still report fear of recurrence 10 years after their diagnosis. So it can be persistent. And what are some of the triggers? Well, as you can kind of infer, you know, coming to the Cancer Institute or a cancer center itself can be a trigger. So routine oncology visits, routine cancer screening, um, and some of this is interesting. It's, it's changing because our treatments for cancers is also evolving. And 
as we know, many of the cancers are starting to develop into more of a chronic illness. And with that, that's going to increase the degree of surveillance that happens and the degree of medical visits. And so, you know, I in, we anticipate that FCR is probably going to increase as an issue, um, especially as we have folks who are living with cancer and having surveillance for many, many, many years. Um, and anniversary of diagnosis or treatment can also be a trigger. Um, and again, colleagues or friends or acquaintances who get diagnosed or if someone unfortunately passes away from their cancer, that's also a trigger. Side effects from past treatment, particularly those that lead to somatic symptoms, and, and again, also unexplained physical symptoms. And we'll talk a little bit more about this, but this does seem to be a significant uh, risk factor in many of the studies when we're looking at FCR. So the main features um, that, that are often talked about and described, and we'll just kind of quickly go through these, is um, increased thoughts about death feeling alone, believing that the cancer would return, um, experiencing uncertainty, uncertainty um, in multiple domains, actually, having cancer-related thoughts and imagery that were difficult to control, daily and recurrent thoughts about FCR, thoughts about FCR that last 30 minutes or longer, experience of increased distress over time, in addition, just the overall experience of distress, and of course, the impact um, of FCR in the individual's daily life, um, and, and especially how we think about optimizing function. So, you know, when we look at predictors and patterns, and there's been there was an interesting study that was done on women with early stage breast cancer. This was a study of 161 women, and what they basically did is they looked at FCR and what happened before a mammogram, mammogram and an after a an mammogram. And they basically looked at and they pulled the data on women who ended up having unremarkable mammograms, so essentially negative mammograms. And they, before the mammogram, they, they did some scales and they measured the degree of FCR. And you can see that there's two sets, two groups here. There's one group with, which has pretty high elevated FCR, and there's another group that is a bit low or lower. And um, be, th even one month before their scheduled mammogram, they did have some significant level of anxiety. In both groups, what you saw was a slight increase in FCR in the week preceding their mammogram, as you might expect. Once they, basically, at the, the minute they got their results of their mammogram, which was essentially negative, their level of FCR plummets. And then it kind of goes down a little bit maybe in the next week. But what you see in both circumstances are that the levels of anxiety slowly return um, or at least have a trajectory upwards over the next month. So um, one of the things that was interesting is, well, that we see what the pattern is, but what, what is the inherent difference between the two groups? Why is there one group which seems to have significantly higher FCR scores versus another group? And what they actually saw in, in that particular study is, at least what panned out was, the ones who were experiencing greater FCR had a greater perceived risk. And they also had low, what's called lower coping self-efficacy. And that is um, when faced with some level of difficulty or adversity, they just don't feel that they can cope well by the, uh, using their strategies by themselves. And um, they also exhibited greater reassurance-seeking behavior. Other studies have been done looking at risk, and on the right-hand column, you'll see one is gender, and this becomes a little bit controversial. And so in some studies, it seems that um, women have greater risk than men. Some other studies seem to show that it's actually somewhat equal. So when we look, for example, at breast cancer versus prostate cancer, it seems to be more common in breast cancer. However, when we look at cancers, in which it is prevalent in both sexes, there doesn't seem to be any statist 
statistical significant difference between men and women. But in other studies, younger age does pan out. Uh, those who have physical symptoms, less formal education, Caucasian or Hispanic um, uh, folks are at, seem to be at increased risk. Those with increased family stressors, those with decreased social support, feeling socially isolated, and those who exhibit lower optimism and, and as you might expect, lower quality of life. So those all seem to be kind of um, risk factors. When you pull all the data together and you look at certain clusters, um, one of them ends up being, if you look, there's a risk of perception or lack of optimism. And there's eight studies that report, report a strong association in this with FCR. So for example, if you have unrealistically high subjective risk, and that might be um, a risk factor, and that might be a strategy for addressing FCR as we move forward. Um, it, the symptom experience that we've talked about, so 22 studies report a strong association with FCR, and this includes you know, global symptom burden, pain, fatigue, body image. Um, and so, you know, looking at education, that might be a means um, to try to help patients as we move forward. Generalized anxiety and other psychiatric conditions related to FCR in many studies, so about a third to half of young women with breast cancer and FCR also meet criteria for generalized anxiety disorder. That's a pretty significantly high number. Um, and it's likely bi-directional with regard to FCR. And, and one thing I, I I think is probably also playing a role is, and I don't think anyone has looked at this and, and specifically, but those with increased anxiety coupled with um, somatic symptoms, including pain, because when we look at the actual pathophysiology of anxiety and the circuitry that's involved, many of the subcortical relay stations for anxiety are the same relay stations for pain um, and other physical symptoms. So there's a significant interrelationship that uh, is at play there. So intervention trials. Well, one study that was done is the Survivors' Worries of Recurrent Disease, uh, also called the SOAR study. And this was a randomized clinical trial comparing five face-to-face -face and three online telephone sessions of cognitive behavioral therapy to treatment as, use, as usual. Um, and so, you know, the basic premise is that emotions such as being scared or thoughts that, you know, my cancer is going to recur and behavior, avoidance, uh, checking, reassurance, seeking are all interrelated. And if you can try to address one of those, you can affect any of the other um, uh, sets of the triad there. And what they basically found is those who were um, in, enrolled in this particular study as compared to the treatment as usual did markedly better um, with regards to FCR scores following their intervention. I don't know if we're gonna upgrade to pro or not, if you guys can see that. They will stay with free. Okay. so. Um, and so that's, you know, using cognitive behavioral therapy in, uh, has been shown to be one uh, effective means of intervention. There's another study called the Fear of Recurrence Therapy, or the FORT trial, and this was women with breast or gynecologic cancer, and they basically enrolled patients in, um, uh, in the treatment arm. There was six sessions. Each one was for two hours. And basically, as you can see there, it's a blend of cognitive behavioral therapy with psychoeducation in multiple domains, and then also aspects of relaxation response and mindfulness techniques. So for example, at the beginning, there's a self-introduction regarding the FCR experience or psycho psychoeducation really, introduction to the trial, there's an introduction of cognitive restructuring, much of what we just talked about, identifying triggers. Um, but the other part that ends up happening as you move through the sessions is working on getting rid of that avoidance behavior. So part of it is it's almost like an exposure type therapy, but 
they're, you know, patients are, are in, encouraged to actually start thinking about and then start documenting what their fears are. And um, so, for example, promoting emotion, expression, and confront specific fears, writing down a worst fear scenario. And um, by doing so, you, you've kind of taken it from that, that nebula of your thoughts and put it in a, tangibly on, on something in front of you that you can actually come up with a uh, means to address in a more pragmatic way. And using mindfulness techniques to help with any emerging anxiety that happens during this process. And, and that particular study also was um, uh, showed significant effectiveness as well. The last study I want to bring up is the Conquer Fear study. And this is a study that's being done over at a group in Australia. And they've already done um, some outcome studies on this. And there's a multi-site randomized cl cl clinical trial that's being done now. But they basically are comparing five session individual intervention that uses a blend of what's called metacognitive therapy and acceptance and commitment therapy and comparing it to what is treatment as usual or relaxation techniques. And so you can see here on the right, there's five sessions and each session really has specific content that's geared. Um, and the sessions generally are 60 to 90 minutes. Um, but again, what you see is it, it, more psychoeducation, more aspects of cognitive behavioral therapy, some aspects of um, acceptance and commitment therapy, and also here what's called attention training technique, which is introduced in session two. And this is kind of an interesting technique where um, uh, the listener is presented with several stimuli, and the goal is basically initially you do what's called selective attention, where there's some a, there's a a tone and your, your job is to focus on this particular tone. And then it moves to what's called switching attention where there's multiple tones and you're, you, you focus on one tone while, if, if you will, drowning out all the other noise and then you switch to another tone. And you're basically practicing um, uh, being in the here and now, focusing on one aspect and disregarding any other sensations or sensory stimuli that may be occurring. And, and, and basically the goal is, for example, if you find yourself ruminating on a particular anxiety or worry, it kind of provides training to start shifting your focus onto other things. And it has some evidence-based data behind it. Um, and then you can see that it, it takes you through kind of a, a progressive level of um, techniques um, when then by session five, you, you do a review of goal setting, su summary and review of skills, and then you develop an FCR relapse prevention plan. So a few things, goals of treatment. FCR is not irrational. Um, it is going to be linked with some existential issues, of course. But importantly, the goal of therapy is not to get rid of FCR completely. But the goal is to pay less attention to it, give less importance to it, try to live better with FCR, have to optimize function and develop goals that are really going to provide life with purpose, meaning, and direction. And so, you know, what are some things that you can do? Well, you know, the, the again, you know, normalize and you validate. So, you know, F, fear of cancer recurrence is, is not abnormal. It's okay to have that, the, the, you know, so you want to normalize it and validate it. Um, Part of sharing with others is, is to get out of this pattern of avoidance, which um, uh, many of us can get into, and then process and make sense of your own responses. Um, and think about how you can optimize com and communicate with your op optimize communication with your treatment team. And so, and this kind of goes back to if you have concerns uh, about physical sensations or you have other concerns, to make sure your your medical team knows those. And you can get the you know appropriate education about what what symptoms you may actually experience during a recurrence versus what may be due to other factors, um, and just having that information may actually start decreasing anxiety and worry. And then use cognitive behavioral therapy techniques. And so there's many manuals, and I, I, I there's one here on the suggested reading list towards the end of the talk. 
that people can utilize. Use acceptance and commitment therapy techniques, and there are some great manuals uh, in this area as well. Use mindfulness strategies, and there's lots of mindfulness apps on phones. There's CDs that can be purchased. There's books that can be um, obtained that are specific for cancer. Um, and then, you know, part of uh, another strategy is considering what's the value to, to you and what's meaningful in your life and really shifting focus and energy to that, particularly when you find um, uh, if too much energy or investment is being utilized in other areas which are not necessarily helpful. But really, uh, much of the research is a blend of all of this. Um, specific for cancer and you know part of the things that I think we can do as we move forward is you know even at SDI is coming up with our own internal program that we can create for patients to utilize some of these techniques moving forward so again there's a lot of unmet needs in multiple domains here and there's some suggested reading that I've provided here for folks uh, some of them are some basic papers if people are interested in addition to some of the manuals that are available um, for people to, to look at mindfulness, anxiety and worry workbook, which is a cognitive behavioral therapy uh, approach um, and mindfulness-based cancer recovery, learning the relaxation response, the guided meditations, which can also, also be helpful as well. I'm gonna stop there and see if folks have questions.